Hello, hello. So today we're going to look at something which will make us feel like real pilots, and that is one of these. So I think this is officially called an instrument approach procedure chart, but they can be called approach charts, approach plates, or any variation of that name. What this page of information does is tell a pilot how to fly an approach to a runway under IFR conditions. That's when visibility is poor and the pilot has to rely on their instruments to navigate. Before we look at one in detail, I'd highly recommend checking out my videos on VOR navigation and ILS approaches before continuing with this one. The lessons learned in those videos will greatly help with understanding the information that is available on an approach chart. Anyway, without further ado, let's look at one in more detail. Now, there are different types of approaches that a pilot can make to an airport. This one that we're going to look at is an ILS, DME and VOR approach to runway 23 at Inverness Airport. Let's start at the top and work our way down. There will be a couple of bits that I'll skim over on purpose, just because I want to try and explain the most practical features on the chart. So at the top of the chart you'll find some general information about the airport that you're flying to. At the top centre here, you can see that we have various radio frequencies that we would use to communicate with Inverness Airport. So you have the approach frequency, a couple of tower frequencies, a radar frequency and also an ATIS frequency so we can listen to the weather report. On the right, you can see a transition altitude of 3000 feet is listed. And just above that, you can see some information explaining what this chart is for. So it's for Inverness Airport, it's an ILS, DME and VOR approach for runway 23. Just below that you can see that three aircraft categories are also listed, A, B and C. I won't go into detail about these categories, but just to explain, category A aircraft will be small planes such as a Cessna, category B will be slightly bigger aircraft such as a twin engine propeller plane, and category C are your normal commercial jets such as a Boeing 737. Next up, we have a picture with lots of information on it. So let's start with what I like to call the background information. So basically, the picture is a map with the topography of the land. Hills and mountains are coloured in depending on their height, and the blue sections indicate prominent stretches of water. If we look closer at the top corner here, you'll also see dots and numbers indicating the height of certain hills. So here there's a hill that's 2,049 feet high and further south there's a peak of land at 1,851 feet. You'll also see some red markings and some red text. This indicates restricted airspace. So the R610 is an identifying code and the 2000 represents the altitude that the restriction is at. So you can see that there's a line under 2000 there that means the aircraft must not fly below 2,000 feet. If you see a line above an altitude like this, that means do not fly above 2,000 feet. And also sometimes on procedure charts, you may see a line above and below an altitude like this. That means that you must fly at that altitude and not be above or below it. Looking back towards the center of this chart, just north of the airport, there's another little bit of restricted airspace, identified as D702. This restricted airspace also has a text box with some more information for pilots. OK, so let's look at the important stuff, the actual information that we need to fly an instrument approach. So I'm going to start by explaining what will basically happen during this approach. A plane will tune into the airport's VOR station and then fly directly over it. Once it passes over the VOR station, it will fly northeast away from the airport, make a long right hand turn to line up with runway 23 and then land. So let's take a closer look. First around the airport we have boxes with nav aid information. IVR is the NDB station and the number is the frequency to tune into that station. You can see that the text box also gives the Morse code identifier and the exact coordinates for the radio station. INS is the VOR station and again it has its frequency, Morse code and coordinates and finally IDX which is the ILS identifier from runway 23. 
Next, let's look at these dark blue lines. And you can see, obviously, that there's two of them. One is for category A and B aircraft, and the other is for category C planes. The R indicates the radial that we need to fly away from the VOR station. So for category A and B, they would fly a radial of 043 degrees away from the VOR station after passing over it. Category C planes would fly a radial of 029 degrees. I hope that makes sense. So when do pilots know when to begin the turn to the right? Well, I've actually photoshopped some information out to make the last step a bit easier to understand. On the full chart, you'll see a little mark with a number at the end of each outbound leg. This is where your DME, your distance measuring equipment, comes in handy. When you reach the specified distance on the chart, that's when you begin your turn. Now the keen-eyed among you will have noticed that two distances are given. This is because the distance can be measured to the ILS system, which in this case is IDX, or it can be measured to the VOR station INS. So the next part of the approach is to make the turn and line up with the runway's localizer, which is defined by the hatch markings extending away from the airport. The runway heading, as you can see, is 234 degrees, so this is what you would set your instruments to. If you follow the localizer back in towards the runway, you'll see one more marking which indicates 6.1 nautical miles away from the ILS system. This is where your final descent to land will begin. This will make more sense when we look at the next section of the chart. So that's everything that a pilot will need to know to transition from flying over the airport to lining up with the runway. I know this might be a lot to take in at the moment, but if you know your VOR navigation, then this should hopefully be making sense. There's a couple more things on this chart which relate to a missed approach, and that's represented by this dotted line here. So if a pilot aborts the landing for any reason, this dotted line gives instructions on where to fly. So in this case, it instructs the pilot to continue flying on a heading of 234 degrees. This gives the pilot time to change the plane from a landing configuration back to stable flight. Then it indicates that the pilot will need to make a right hand turn and fly back to the VOR station. From there the pilot has two options. Option 1 is what we've just learnt, to go and fly the approach again by following an outbound radial to the northeast, turning right and lining up with the runway again. Option 2 is that they can enter a holding pattern above the airport which is represented by this small oval. The text around this oval gives instructions on how to fly this holding pattern. It needs to be flown at 3000 feet and at no more than 210 knots. So when the pilot gets back to the VOR station he needs to make a 180 degree turn to the left then fly straight and level for one minute on a heading of 230 degrees. After that one minute they will make another 180 degree turn to the left and fly a heading of 050 degrees back to the VOR station. The pilot can then continue to circle anti-clockwise over the airport. From here they can rejoin the approach once they get back to the VOR station or they can divert to a different airport if needs be. So that covers pretty much everything for the map portion of the chart. Let's move down to the next section of the chart which gives instructions on how to descend during the approach. This first little bit gives information about the final descent to the runway. You can see that it's a 3 degree glide slope. Then just below that are the altitudes that you should be at for the given distance. So at 5 nautical miles away from the runway you should be at 1670 feet. At 4 miles you should be at 1350 and so on. Below that you have the main diagram for the descent during the approach. So let's start with the vertical column on the left. This represents the VOR station and you can see that you need to be passing over the station at 4000 feet. Then you can see two lines again depending on which category of aircraft you're flying. So after passing over the VOR, you need to begin your descent straight away, all the way down until you reach the point at which you begin the turn. You can see that the distances for the turn are marked again with these dotted lines. 
and also on the right you can see that you need to descend and level off at 2000 feet and then make a level turn to line up with the localizer. If you follow the line back to the left now, you'll see this little cross icon again at 6.1 nautical miles. This is where you intercept the glide slope and begin your final descent to the runway. On the left, you can see another dotted line, indicating what to do in the event that landing is aborted, which is to climb away from the airport on a heading of 234 degrees. Just below that on the chart, on the left you have some information about clearing obstacles which I won't talk about in this video and on the right you have some guidelines of what your vertical speed should be depending on your ground speed. I believe this is for the final approach to the runway, not the descent from the VOR down to the turn. So that's pretty much how you read an approach chart. Now before I wrap up this video there's a couple of things I want to mention. I will be recording an extra video in the next few days where I demonstrate the use of an approach chart for runway 5 at Inverness, so click on the picture in this video or on the link below to go and see that. Also, you should be able to find charts for airports that you want to fly at online. For example, when looking for Inverness charts, I simply searched for EGPE charts, which brought me to the NATS website which offers a lot of charts for UK airports. I also quickly tested KLAX charts and found some charts for Los Angeles as well. So if, it seems to me that if you search by the airport's unique four letter code, you should be able to find some. They may be out of date, but it's better than nothing, right? Speaking of things being out of date, you may also find that the information that you see on the chart does not match the information in FSX. For example, in FSX, at Inverness, Runway 23 is listed as having a runway heading of 235 degrees, however on my chart it's listed as 234 degrees. This is because FSX is an old game now, it was released back in 2006 and of course airports change over time. So I would recommend using a chart to get an idea of how to fly an approach, but double check the specific details in FSX to make sure that you get your instruments set up accurately. So looking forward to my next video, I'm going to take a look at Plan G, a flight planning program which you can use with FSX. Hope to see you there, many thanks for watching and I will catch you later.